Hey, what's going on? It's Bill Burr, and it's time for the Monday Morning Podcast for Monday, July 15th, 2019. Oh my God, the summer's half over. It really isn't half over, but everybody considers that the summer is over in um, at the end of August. Like, that's the end of it. Like, you're still in school. You know, like you can't put the boat in the water in September. What are you talking about? This is the golden age of global warming. You can fucking water ski to like October 1st. Yeah, enjoy it. Enjoy the warm water before it evaporates, everybody. That's what I say. Get out there, put some gas in your boat. Let that oil trickle out in the water. Let them fish know that you were there. You know? Couldn't just do it like the Native Americans? Couldn't just make a nice fucking little boat and just paddle along nice and quiet? Sneak up on a fucking badger or a fucking... What's in the water? A badger. What are those things? They look like badgers, but they got flat tails. Beaver. Beaver! Can't fucking do that? Nope. No, I got me, got me a uh, uh, two big Chevy, big block outboard motors. Get me up about 85 mile an hour. Tell you what, people get the fuck out my way when I come in. I come in doing like 30 miles an hour. Bump your shit all up against the dock. I don't, what? Fucking what? Um... Anyways, the summer is like half, it's not halfway over. You know, so I'm sitting here and I'm, I'm talking, right, as I do, and I don't even know what the fuck I'm talking about. Uh, when is the summer? Dumbest question. Friday, June 21st until September 23rd. Well, we're not, how many, wait, how many, we're not even fucking that close yet. Here I am blowing the whistle here, getting everybody panicked like the cop in Jaws. Get out of the water. Get out of the water. Uh, how many days in summer? The length of astronomical varies between 89 and 93 days. Ah, Jesus fucking Christ. So now what do I do? I got to go back and I got to look up June 21st. June 21st to September 23rd. How many days is that? Well, I can do that in my head. That's uh, 40 days. The end of uh, July. Then there's another 30. That's 71 days plus 23. 71 and 23 is fucking 94. Shit, it's just beginning. Fuck that. Put your feet up. Have a good time. Get yourself uh, uh, one of those fucking awful American beers that they, they squeeze lime into for you. Get yourself a Bud Lime. Um... Well, there's one other person we'll never be advertising here on the podcast. Budweiser Lime. I like the I like the original Budweiser best. You know, no offense to the Latino community out there. I'm not into the Bud Light. Um. All right, plowing ahead here. Uh, I had a great week. You know, another week on the movie. Week seven begins today. Oh, Billy, fucking uh, thespian here. Oh, Billy Shakespeare here. (laughs) I got today off. I ain't doing shit. And um, actually, this Thursday, I also have off on the movie. And I'm going into a edit room. And I'm looking at my special to see if it's going to have the right look and the right sound. Other than that, all the cuts have been made. Everything's ready to go. And I'm hoping, I'm hoping... That that thing will come out sometime, you know, before the end of the summer, right? And I've been having such a great time uh, working out this new hour, you know, with some hiccups here and there, you know. I I did some stand-up at this club last week, and I was telling this story where this lesbian just, like, went out of her way to fucking bump into me. And, uh, you know, there was some, I, I guess, gay women in the crowd or allies. I don't know what they were, but God forbid I tell that fucking story, right? And they got all fucking pissed off, you know? 
And, you know, I guess they talk to each other because they both immediately <laughs> started yelling at the same time. So you know me. You know me when there's a situation like that. I do everything I can to defuse it because I'm an adult. And they started yelling, yeah, lesbians aren't men. What are you fucking out of this shit? And I just said, hey, shut the fuck up. <laughs> That's what I began with. I forget what I say to, said in the middle. But then they were leaving. I was like, oh, 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 white women are leaving. Everybody care. Oh, my God. They're packing up and they're leaving, right? So they fucking leave. And they go downstairs. And I get off stage. And I rumor has it there at the bar. And it was raining out that night. And I wore a raincoat. All right? I'm not into umbrellas. Umbrellas. The only way umbrella works is if it's a light rain falling straight down. Other than that, the only thing an umbrella does is it keeps from the bridge of your nose up dry. The rest of you is is different degrees of wet. If your knees down is soaked, right? From your knees to about your waist is medium, and then, you know, your shirt, you're just chilly. I get a raincoat, fucking hangs down to the knees. Calves and, you know, from calves down still get soaked, okay? And I put the fucking hood up. So anyways, I'm walking out. And I know those, those, you know, these fucking women are there. You know, in defense of them, it was a woman show, I think, slash gay show. I wasn't really sure. I was on stage and there was like paper cutouts of uh, dicks, penises, whatever you call. So at that point, it's like, okay. It's going to get a little hamburger hairy here. Okay, I get it. But I'm still just going to do my shit, you know? And considering these are two groups of people, the vibe here, that have been oppressed, you know, for expressing themselves, clearly they'll be open-minded to me doing the same, right? Not well, That was not the case. You know what's funny? When they left, the whole crowd was, I'm like, because they're like, you're not funny. I'm like, what are you talking about? The whole place is laughing. And everybody laughs. So then they get up and fucking leave. Make a big fucking scene. So then I say, are you guys all having a good time? Yeah, you all think, you guys think this is funny, right? And they're like, yeah. So I go, all right, well then make sure on Monday. Make sure on Monday. You know, when they hashtag me and try to get me in trouble and you guys all keep your mouth shut, that you feel a certain level of shame about it. <laughs> then I started imitating them. You know, peeking over the walls of their cubicles, being like, is it over yet? Is it over? Um, so I'm having a great time. So I get off stage, and all these years of being a comedian, I know good and goddamn well that whenever somebody gets kicked out of a comedy club, that just means they're just on the other side of the door, and there's a good chance that they've actually walked back in because that's the level of security at a comedy club. They kick them out right to the other side of the door, and then the bouncer just turns his back and goes, well, that's all settled. And then the person just walks back in. The amount of fucking times that it happened to me back in the day when I was selling a CD, compact disc to all you youngsters out there, after my show. And somebody, I would get into it, and it would escalate to the point of almost a fight. And then, don't worry, we'd kick the guy out, and then I'd be fucking selling CDs. And who the fuck is standing in the line? Funniest shit ever, right? Dumb drunk, you know, sees a line in front of the guy who wants to punch in the face. So he stands in line to punch me in the face, right? You know, it's already, you're going to commit battery not assault right assault is threatening it's the threat that the punch is going to be thrown battery is the actual hit as far as i know a lot of people think assault is hitting somebody let's look that one up huh it might differ from state to state i know there's a lot of ins and outs and there's probably a lot of fucking little lawyers out there going to try to difference between assault and battery the main difference between battery, a battery charge and assault charge is the actual presence of harm and the threat of harm. Yeah, battery is the presence of harm. You punch somebody in the face and there's a little bruise there and there's a little cheekbone. The threat of harm is I'm going to fucking kill you or you're, I don't know, waving a gun around. I don't know what it is. Someone can only be charged with battery if they have caused real physical harm to someone, while a person can be charged with assault if the mere threat of harm is present. That must be you slipped the punch. <laughs> so anyways, I put on my raincoat. I zip it up. I button it on top of that, right? No rain getting in on my fucking torso. 
So I put the hoodie up and I walk upstairs and I, I mean downstairs and I am informed that the fucking uh, loud hooas are at the bar. So I just keep my head down and I fucking walk right by the bar and I think I'm in the clear. I go to get outside. It's fucking humid as shit. I take the hood off and all of a sudden I hear the same two fucking voices screaming and yelling. I just told them to go fuck themselves. I really did. I, I did. I mean, I'll have a conversation if you want to, but if that's the way you're going to come at me, you're going to get the same res- level of respect that you're showing me, which is absolutely nothing. And here's the thing. I'm just working the story out. There's going to be some fucking potholes, right? Let me tell you something else about those two fucking allies or lesbians, whatever. If I went up there and just started saying that, that Trump has sex with his own son or something crazy about people on the right, they would have been giving me a standing ovation. So there really isn't anything about stereotypes or anything like that. What it really is about is about them and their fucking little kitchen of shit that they feel is, is, is beyond reproach. So fuck them. All right? As I've maintained, if you want to control what a comedian says, do not go to a comedy club. All right? Hire, ha, have a private party, hire a comic with a list of topics that are off limits and the rest of the shit that you can talk about. Then you can complain. Other than that, shut the fuck up. That's how I look at it. You know, not saying you can't heckle. All right, not saying you can't heckle. But when you're saying, you know, you're not even funny while well, I'm in the middle of killing. You, what you should say is, we don't find you funny. Whatever, I don't give a fuck. Now I'm telling you what to say. Say whatever the fuck you want to say. So the very next night, I go out and I do the same bit. I add two little adjustments to it. It all goes fucking smoothly. And this time I'm down in the village. You know? Right near NYU, it's like beyond liberal. And the whole fucking thing kills. So I'm feeling great about that. Then I'm on stage and I, I was doing the abortion bit. And at one point I look over and I see this guy who's laughing so hard. He literally has like his head in his hands and he's, sh- he's shaking his head. And it's literally every reason why you become a comedian. It's for that fucking laugh. And I couldn't tell if he was laughing like finally somebody is saying what I think on this subject or I can't believe he just said that. I don't know what it is, but this guy was laughing so hard and was having such a good time. He actually made me laugh. It was like perfect, which then made me go even farther. And I riffed this other line. And then I heard this comedian, Greer Greer Barnes, who's one of my favorite comics of all time. And also one of the most difficult comics I've ever tried to follow. I made him laugh with that line. And uh, that was it. That was literally the, the... the entire fucking reason I ever got up to do stand-up. Make people die laughing in the crowd and then have comics that I love and respect laugh at my jokes and think that I'm funny. That was it. That was it right there. That's why I did it. Not to get into arguments with fucking assholes in the crowd. That's not why I did it. Did it? Do it. So, I had the perfect night and I was doing a bunch of sets because I had to get ready because uh, Dave Chappelle is in town doing a two-week run at a Broadway theater. Sold out, wire to wire, and um, I was going to get to do stand-up on Broadway. So, you know, I'm walking over there with my lovely wife and uh, a buddy of mine, and we fucking get over to the theater. There's all these people in the streets, too. We're just like, geez, what the fuck are all these people doing in the street? This is so crowded. And And I made a comment about how crowded Times Square is compared to 10 years ago. And my buddy's like, ah, you know, I don't know. You look back those old time pictures. There's a bunch of people in the streets. And it's just like, yeah, but there weren't this many, you know. And also 10 years ago, there weren't that many. And he goes, no, there weren't. It's like, nah, they, well, I don't know. 20 years ago, there wasn't. And he argues with me that there were. And I was like, dude, 20 years ago, when I first came at 25 years ago, it was still sort of taxi driver, you know, jerk off shops down there in, uh, Times Square. There wasn't like the fucking M&M store with the peeps show in the lobby, you know, that you had to walk by and people fucking jerking off. And that guy with the fucking, <laughs> the guy on cleanup duty and all of that shit. Um, it wasn't like that. And it's just, there was all of these fucking people. And 
I have heard that the population has gone up by like a million people in the last 25 years over here. But anyway, we got our answer when we got to the theater and they opened the door and it was like pitch black in there. And they said, uh, there's a power outage on this side of Broadway. It was so crazy. The west, the east side of, Hall, of Broadway was totally lit up. Everything looked normal. And then the, uh, the west side was, was totally dark. And I got this really cool picture that I ended up taking, put it up on my Instagram of Times Square where half of it is lit up like it always is and the other half is just blank screens. So we go in there and there's all these comics and shit. Some are going to be on the show. Some are just hanging out. We're all in there with like our fucking cell phones with the flashlights. And we just, I just sort of walked out on the stage to look at it. And they had the emergency lights on, which was really cool. I saw this beautiful theater. It was 730. And I was just thinking like, all right, it's 730. You know, the show doesn't start till late. They're going to figure something out. There's too much money to be, that's being lost right now. That there isn't some sort of emergency generator or some shit that's going to happen. And then it was 7.45, and then it was 5 of 8. And then at 8 o'clock, somebody just said, all right, in 8.15, if these aren't on officially, we have to call it. And I just started getting this sinking feeling that I was not going to be able to do a set and then get to watch the master himself, Dave Chappelle, do 90 minutes, two hours, whatever he was going to do. And... uh Lo and behold, 8.15 came around, the lights didn't come on, so I did not get to open for Dave, did not get to tell my dick and shit jokes on Broadway, and uh, yeah, and I didn't get to watch Dave, most importantly, because Dave, like at this point, literally like transcends stand-up. It's, it's its own deal, you know? So now we're like, ah, fuck. So then we all go outside, and... Um, there's just a group of us comics and shit. <laughs> and now there's just people walking in the streets. It's like Bedlam on the west side, right? So my buddy goes, let's walk this way. And he's pointing west, further into the blackout, to try and get a cab. And it's like, no, dude, let's go to east, where there's still civilization. Lights are on. And because the lights are on, people are not walking in the streets and they're abiding by the law. So we got over there and we walked over to about 6th Avenue. And we get over to 6th Avenue, and uh, my buddy goes, let's keep going and go to 5th Avenue and try and get a cab. I'm like, don't you think everybody's doing that right now? None of these cars are moving. So we fucking make a quick plan. Let's just go down to the cellar. So we all walked like 50 blocks uh, down to the comedy cellar, just laughing and telling stories and just had like ended up having like the best time walking all the way down there. Um Fortunately, my wife had worn some comfortable shoes, even though she still looked like a knockout. She had the comfy shoes on. And um, because, ladies, you know, you have to have a little bit of pain to look good. Um, Sorry. So we all just walked down. uh, What was it? Sixth Avenue. Oh, did we go down Broadway? No, we ended up going down Broadway at Macy's. We switched to Broadway and then we just went all the way down. Switched to 5th Avenue, 23rd Street, went right down to fucking Washington Square Park, walked around the block, and um, we got down there, and Chappelle was on stage. He ended up bringing me up. Um, I had another great time. It wasn't Broadway, but it was still fun, and we just hung out. It ended up being a great thing anyways, because uh, my lovely wife used to work on Tough Crowd, so she knows all those guys, and they all hadn't seen her in a minute. So she ended up having a good time and ended up being great. And then Bobby Kelly, greatest guy you ever, ended up giving us a ride back uptown. And it was uh, it was one of those New York nights. Um, so anyway, what do we got here? How much time? Was it time for the fucking advertising here? Look at that. 19 fucking minutes. Just babbling on and babbling on. You know what I have been talk, uh, been totally getting into was reading this Ken Stable book because it's getting me totally back into like, the 70s NFL that was my favorite time ever and um, there was all these great defense nicknames back then and I never knew that the Raiders their secondary was called the Soul Patrol I had never heard that Um, that was the uh, I guess because it was all black um, secondary which was that like a big deal back then I don't know I don't know Uh, Jack Tatum Willie Brown Skip Thomas aka Dr. Death Jack Tatum, the assassin, 
old man Willie Brown and uh, George Atkinson. And uh, so I actually looked up to see if they made a T-shirt that had Soul Patrol on it. I mean, that would be fucking great. But the only thing they have is they have this really weird Raider jersey that it just says Soul Patrol and then has all their numbers. It just doesn't look good. Looks like an old person's phone where the numbers are gigantic, you know, when they would push the buttons back in the day. Um, so I came across this website and they were talking about um, all the great nicknames. Of course, Doomsday and Steel Curtain are the two greatest. Then Purple People, as far as I'm concerned, then the Purple People Eaters. Doomsday defense was the Dallas Cowboys. The Steel Curtain was the Super Steelers <clears throat> that won four Super Bowls. Unheard of. Doubled the Green Bay Packers at that point, the Dolphins and anybody else who had won two at that point. And um, <clears throat> what else did they have? Uh, then it just kind of drops off. The Killer Bees, which was it was the Dolphins defense that had all those guys with the same uh, last name, began with the B. Monsters of the Midway is a great one for the uh, Chicago Bears. But I heard they actually took, they appropriated that name from a college uh, team out there in Illinois. Um, I can't remember the other ones, but the one that I came across, they had the 1977 Atlanta Falcons the, called the Grits Blitz. <clears throat> and um, then I saw all these articles that were saying that the 1977 Atlanta Falcons was actually the greatest defense ever. And statistically, the way they were presenting the numbers, it held up. Over the 85 Bears, or say the 2000 Ravens, were the, the comparisons. But what they didn't take into consideration was uh, it was a 14 game season. They only went seven and seven. I guess their offense was completely anemic. I'm not saying they weren't great, but to say they're the greatest of all time, you look at their schedule. They played in the NFC West. They, they played the 49ers and the Saints four times, uh, and both those teams were fucking horrific. And uh, and then on top of that, eight out of the their 14 games were against teams with losing records. So and then you also combine the fact with like, I don't know, it, it just all the all the rule changes for offense and all of that crap. Um, the 85 Bears, and I guess to make it fair, the 85 Bears and the 2000 Ravens would not put up the same numbers. But I don't it's always hard. But it's a great argument that they're making. And it also shines light on a forgotten incredible defense um, that put up statistically the best numbers of all time in a 14 game season um, I think that's a big thing when you don't when you go to 16 games that should be you know the same way the NFL doesn't count NFL championships for some reason versus Super Bowls I think that they there should be a different time for like 14 game season versus a 16 game season and then also how much the game has changed. And it's just all about offense, how much they throw the ball. I was actually reading in that Ken Stabler book, he was talking about he had a game where he threw 47 times. And he goes, and you know anytime you have to throw the ball that many times, you're not going to win, which is hilarious because that's exactly how the game is played now. And if you go to the NFL um, encyclopedia, whatever the NFL uh, reference, whatever the fuck it is, to show you how much the game has changed, if you look up the top like 50 running backs of all time, there's only like four or five active guys. And if you look up the top like 50 passers of all time, five of the top eight all time are still active. Um, number one is still playing. And like, and then two of the other guys in the top eight are Peyton Manning, who retired in 2015, and Brett Favre, who retired in 2010. So you're talking about, like, basically six of the top eight. Five of the top eight are still playing, and six of the top eight were still playing as of 2010. Um, it just goes to show you how much the, how much the, uh, the game has changed. But it's actually a really interesting thing to, to look up. Um, that that 1977 Atlanta Falcons defense because I it somehow escaped me. There was no uh, ESPN back then. Also, I started watching football in '77. I was in third grade, and I I think I started watching in like the playoffs. I remember the playoffs that year. I remember Tampa. I want to say made the playoffs one of those years, and they beat like the Rams nine to nothing or lost to the Rams nine to nothing. Maybe that was seven to. 79 
It's fucked how I can remember that, but I can't remember a movie I literally just saw, like how it ends, or, or the name of somebody who's in it. Um, all right, let's do a little bit of advertising here. Shall we? Um, oh, no, what is this? What is this? This is not the right stuff. I got the wrong advertising here. Hang on a second. God damn it, Bill. What is wrong with you? Are you kidding me? Are you fucking kidding me here? Is this the one? Oh, here it is. Here it is. Okay, okay, okay. All right. Uh, Simply safe. Uh, Did you know most breakups happen in between six break-ins, not break-ups? Break-ins happen between 6 a.m. and 6 p.m. I did not know that. Most breakups happen between 6 p.m. and 6 a.m. Unless you go with the fucking email breakup. Huh? You guys into that? Is that how you millennials do it? Wait, 6 a.m. to 6 p.m. in the middle of the day, they say. Oh, these fucking arrogant bastards. You know why that is? It's because everything's dressed down now. They used to have just dressed down Fridays, and the rest of the week you go, you always had to dress up, you know? Now you can just wear whatever you want when you go to work. It's the same thing with people that break into your house. Like back in the day, like someone broke into your house, they dressed like a cat burglar. They had the little fucking Zorro mask on. They don't do it anymore. They're just dressing all casual. So you think it's a fucking landscaper. The next thing you know, somebody stole your fine china. Uh, Simply Safe protects your whole home, every window, room, and door with 24 7 monitoring. For just a fraction of the cost. Their police dispatch is up to 3.5 times faster because they use video verification. There's no contract, hidden fees, or fine print. It's designed to blend right into your home. No wires, no drilling. It's easy to order and easy to set up. Usually in under an hour. Hour? Simply Safe has won a ton of awards from CNET to the New York Times wire cutter, prices are always fair and honest. Around the clock monitoring is just fifteen dollars a month. Visit simplysafebird.com and you'll get free shipping and a sixty day risk trial. Sixty day f- risk free trial. Good lord, Bill. You got nothing to lose. Go now and be sure you go go now and be sure you go to simplysafebird.com. Jesus. So they know our show sent you. That's simplysafebird.com. Sorry. Uh, don't worry. There's only one more read left. Okay, here we go. Uh, uh, uh. Stamps.com. Uh, no one really has time to go to the post office. You're busy. Who's got the time for all that traffic, parking, lugging all your mail and packages? It's a real hassle, man. Well, we should have more time with all the technology. That was the pipe dream we all chased, right? In the future, with all this technology, we were supposed to be working less. Somehow we're all working more. You remember when you used to watch the Jetson and Jetson and George would get to work? His little flying car would you know, turn, in, turn into a briefcase and he would just somehow be able to carry that thing in. And he would sit down at his desk and be like, oh, these three-day work weeks are murder. He worked Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday. And he had Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday off. How fucking great would that be? I actually think it would be great for the population problem because people would get so drunk and so fat that they'd probably shave 15 years off their life. Anyways, that's why you need Stamps.com, one of the most popular time-saving tools for small businesses. Whether you're in a small office sending invoices, an online seller shipping out products, or even a warehouse sending thousands of packages a day, Stamps.com can handle it all with ease. Simply use your computer to print U.S. postage 24-7 for any letter, any package, any class of mail, anywhere you want to send. Once your mail is ready, just hand it to your mail carrier or drop it in the mailbox. It's that simple. Stamps.com is a no-brainer, saving you time and money. It's no wonder over 700,000 small businesses already use Stamps.com. Right now, my listeners can get a special offer that includes a four-week trial plus free postage and a digital scale without any long-term commitment. Just go to Stamps.com, click on the microphone at the top of the homepage, and type in Burr, B-U-R-R, that's Stamps.com, enter Burr. All right, and with that, with that, is it time for the questions, the questions, the questions? I believe it is. All right, Tin Foil Hat Podcast. Dear Billy, right on red. Love it. A year or so ago, I started listening to Sam Tripoli's Tin Foil Podcast 
while looking for more podcasts on your network, uh, the All Things Comedy Network. And by the way, thank you to everybody that watched Ian Edwards' stand-up special on Comedy Central. It was a big hit. The ratings were awesome. Please look for it online at ComedyCentral.com. Um, okay, one of the finest things I remember him talking about being Sam Tripoli about was the Epstein pedophile guy and how it was fucked up that he never went to jail for a bunch of stuff he got caught for. I was listening at work, so I had plenty of time to Google and confirm that even a year ago, there was enough evidence to fry this guy in the chair. Yeah, rich people who have their own islands, they, they don't go to jail. One day I brought it up to some co-workers during a conversation about how rich people don't go to jail unless other rich people want them to. That not that the truth? And they laughed this off like I, it couldn't be true because the official story is always the story according to these guys, meaning the guys protecting the person. Cut to last Friday, I reminded them that they said there's no way a well-known billionaire could ever evade heinous crimes like that. One of the reasons was, quote, why wouldn't any news anchor want to be the one to break that news and get all the attention? Uh, maybe because they don't actually decide what they report. Anyway, go fuck yourself and do the Chip Chipperson podcast while you're in New York, please. Um, I would love to do that. Hey, uh... I was hoping you were going to say what your friend said when you said that you were right. Yeah, absolutely. They don't go to fucking jail. I don't understand people that just sort of believe in the whole, like they believe that the system is not, that certain people don't have advantages. I, I don't understand that on any level, any level whatsoever. There's always, you know, and the, and the thing about it is, is regular people walking around. Like if there's a long line outside the club okay but you know the bouncer or you know somebody who works there or your friend knows somebody you're going to get in you're not going to have to wait in the line like everybody else you know how that works that little that simple example goes all the way up to ridiculous levels of power they know somebody inside and then they're not going to get fucking punished you know if you're a billionaire and you have your own island and you're a fucking pedophile how you stay out of jail is you just donate to fucking politicians' campaigns. Give money to the cops. You just do shit like that. And then they don't want to bite the hand that feeds, and then they fucking look the other way. That's, that's, that's how it works. I know I'm overly simplifying it, but, um, yeah. I mean, that guy, I don't know. I mean, I actually think putting him to death would be too fucking good for him. Those people should just be shot in the street like fucking dog. Well, you don't want other people to see it and be traumatized by seeing somebody get their brains blown out. But, um, no, that guy should have to beg for mercy the way his victims did. And then he, he should be shown the same mercy that he showed those kids. Like those people who do that, I, I don't, you know, light them on fire. I, I'm okay with that. Um, all right. <laughs> I'm sorry. How do you get back to the comedy there? I've been addicted to... I got back into watching American Greed. Do, 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 do. When we return on American Greed. They always have to do like the opposite. He was setting sail to have a vacation in the only continent he had never been to, Antarctica. But things were about to heat up. <laughs> It's always that. As he rode the elevator up to the penthouse, his personal life was about to come crashing down. Woo, 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 woo. American greed. You know, when you watch American greed, you really get annoyed by the, the Americans who are greedy. But after a while, you, you watch that show long enough, you're like, wow, there are a lot of fucking stupid people out there. I met him, and he seemed real nice, and then, you know, he paid for my wild wings, and then asked me if I could give him $10,000, and he seemed so nice, he was calling me miss and ma'am, and he paid for my buffalo wings, so I gave him $10,000. 
Came back a week later, wanted another 10. When I said no, he just started yelling at me, tearing up my fucking house. When we return. Um, all right, fuck motorcycles. All right, this sounds like it's going to be about as open-minded as my opinion. Uh, hey, Ready Mercury. One of my friends actually said Ready Berk- Mercury. Took it to another level. Uh, longtime fan, blah, blah. Bill, I loved your topic on motorcycles. Uh, and I, by the way, Emma, I love fucking motorcycles. All right, I watched another one of those MotoGPs. I finally watched that whole race where uh, Jorge Lorenzo took out um who did he take out he took out uh um valentino rossi davizioso and uh maverick uh what's his face there the guy who's been t-boned like fucking four races this year was it maverick venez i don't know if i can say that. i don't know why, why, why do i try venales right Vignet, I don't know. I'm too white to say pronounce his name right yet. I'll get it. I'll get it. I watched that race. And still, it was exciting. Even though, you know, Mark Marquez was out in front in a Formula One kind of way where the, the race was fucking over unless he just wiped out like he did in Austin, Texas. Um, it was still exciting watching people fighting for the second, third, and fourth positions. All sort of passing going on. It was, it was, it was still a great race. I felt bad for the people that were there because I imagine most of them were fans of those four fucking people that were now out of the race immediately. I mean, it's within like the first 10 laps that it happened. Um, Oh, by the way, congratulations to Lewis Hamilton being the first Formula One driver ever to win the British Grand Prix six times. And of course he gets like the, the level of fucking like racism is back the way cocaine is. Racism like cocaine is back. Like, like really overt, like people in the press just asking like all kinds of just fucking racist. They, they were questioning his level of Britishness. It's like, where was he born? Great Britain. Well, there you go. <laughs> where did he grow up? Great Britain. There you go. What is the question? Oh, he's got too much of a tan for you. Because he lives in Monaco or some shit. Like most of the race car drivers. And there's all kinds of British people that live in fucking Spain and France and all of that shit. It's just so fucking ugly. They just can't handle the fact that somebody who isn't white broke a fucking record. To this fucking day, it's like Will Chamberlain's still playing. I don't know. Disappointing. I did like what, uh, what's his face, teammate there said. He's like, dude, we all fucking live in Monaco. <laughs> Valtteri Botas having his teammates back. That's a good thing. Um, anyway, where, where was I? We're talking motorcycles. But I, I do love motorcycles. And um, But you know when people on motorcycle 100% of the time are blaming the way people drive and then they don't look at a lot of their peers the way they ride on motorcycles and you know the amount of fucking laws they break every quarter mile. Uh, it's a little ridiculous. All right. So, hey, Ready Mercury, longtime fan, blah, blah, blah. Uh, Bill, I loved your topic on motorcycles. I've ranted and raved about those stupid fucking driving 120 miles, stupid fucks driving 120 miles per hour, weaving in and out of traffic, then having the balls to bitch and make watch out for motorcycle T-shirts, stickers, and you name it. How about you guys drive like responsible drivers and maybe you wouldn't die? All right. Now, I... You're, there's a point to be made with what you're saying there. There is a lot. They, they act like motorcyclists when they bring up that, you know, telling you to look out for riders, which you should certainly do. They act like, you know, 99% of the time it's the, it's the guy in the car's fault. Um, what you have to understand if you're riding a motorcycle is that people just can't fucking see you. You know, nobody's trying to fuck up their own car. So when somebody pulls out in front of somebody that's on a motorcycle, it's because they can't fucking see. It's inherently fucking dangerous, which, by the way, for all you non-motorcycle riders, that's why motorcycles are so loud. For all you fucking hipster nerd douches out there who, like, think it's, you know, it's because of some underlying insecurity that they have to be so fucking loud, that's because you can't see them and they don't want to die. All right? 
Not saying that there's not insecure people on motorcycles sometimes, but there's also plenty of insecure people driving cars who don't have the balls to ride a motorcycle. All right, so anyway. Um, he said, how about you guys drive like responsible drivers and maybe you wouldn't die? Well, that's not 100% true. They would still die because people don't drive. It, it, there should be responsible driving on both sides. Anyways, he goes, I'm not talking about the Harley riders. It's those douchebags on the fucking bikes that go way too fast. Yeah, okay, I agree with this. Who drive like an arrogant prick weaving through all of us trying to drive home from work. It's scary to see them zipping past you because one mistake by you and they're dead and you have to face the consequences of their reckless actions. Yeah, like if somebody, they come flying by and then they run into you. I would not want to have one of those guys in one of those fucking Japanese super bikes uh, T-bone me on my driver's side door. I just don't think my crumple zones are going to save me from significant, if not fatal, injury. Because at the end of the day, those bikes weigh, I don't know how much they weigh, four, 500 pounds coming at you 100 miles an hour. I don't think my door is going to be able to handle that. Um, anyways, he says, that's my piece. Thanks for listening. Go fuck yourself. Uh, P.S. Can you tell us the name of the movie you're doing yet? Would love to check it out. Well, it's not out yet, and it's it just has a working title. Um, you know, in a perfect world, like, they'd have, like, I would say car and truck roads and then motorcycle roads and then a bike lane. We could all stay away from each other. But um, I would be just afra- just as afraid to ride in an all motorcycle lane because then I think that those people who ride like lunatics amongst cars would be even more fucking arrogant. Um, I don't know. It's not even arrogant. What it is is it's just, it's a young person brain where you just feel like it's not going to be you. I'm not going to be the one that dies or gets fucked up or loses a leg or something like that. And uh, yeah, I don't know. But having said that, I absolutely, absolutely fucking love motorcycles. And uh, I wish that they were safer. If they were, I would ride one. Or I wish I lived in a, a place in the middle of nowhere where I could actually ride and not feel like, you know, I don't know. Just even just riding one in general is just, even on a straightaway, the, the speed limit is so fucking dangerous. Like, you ever just think about how how fucked up it is that when you're driving down the street because of the rules of the road and that, that yellow line painted in the middle that like you're driving like whatever, 50 miles an hour. The other person's driving 45, 50 and you guys pass each other head on going the exact opposite direction that close going around turns and all of that. And it all works because you maintain the rules of the road. But if you were on an unmarked, like just parking lot and you're both driving like that, you'd both slow down like, whoa, whoa, what is this guy doing? What is this guy doing? But you kind of take that for granted. And you get the fact that people text now. This is why I got rid of um, the motorcycle I had for probably about six weeks, maybe two months. Is I was riding down um, Santa Monica Boulevard. Scared to death, by the way. Um, and I got out to near where the Playboy Mansion used to be. And I was going around a turn. And this guy was coming around the turn too fast. And he was like on the double line. And... I was towards the double line because you kind of have to pick a side because in the middle of the road is where all the fucking transmission fluid, oil and shit from cars leaks and you could wipe out in a turn. So I was leaning into the turn and he came over. So it just felt like his car was going to hit my head. So I had to stand the bike up for like a split second, but it felt like fucking 20 seconds in a turn. And then I had to lean again, and I was thinking I was getting into that oil. Am I just going to go slide into these fucking trees? I went from, am I going to fucking lose my head to am I going to have my leg ripped off and then slam into these trees and get paralyzed in, like, about a second and a half? And I didn't happen, fortunately. And then I rode the bike all the way to the beach. We stopped to get some food or something. I got off the bike, and I was shaking just ever so, like, just a little bit. And I was thinking, like, all right, is that from the vibration of the bike? Like, what the fuck's going on? And I was like, oh, no, that's because I'm scared shitless. So we finished eating. I got back on the bike, and I said a prayer, which I never do. (laughs) A 
was just like, God, if you fucking get this, me and this bike back in one piece, I promise you I will never ride this thing again. And I didn't. I got it into the garage and I just said, fuck it. Like, this isn't for me. I am not a, uh, there's a certain type of personality. I just, I, I don't know. I like playing drums. I need my legs, okay? I, I got to chase my kid around. I can't do this. I'm a stand-up comedian, okay? I can't come hobbling on fucking stage. And I just like, I can't fucking do this. But I, I, I would be lying to you if I told you that I didn't miss it every time I saw one. Like, uh, I actually remember Chappelle telling me when he found out that I was, started, was starting to ride, he was very excited and he asked me, have you ridden a Ducati yet? And I said, no. He said, dude, I'm telling you, you ride one of those things, you'll never ride another bike. And it's to this day, it bugs me I'd never ridden a Ducati. Um, and I will someday, but I will ride one in a track where there's no other cars. <laughs> um, I mean, maybe that's the way to do it. I, but I think you would just get sick of it after a while. Like if you just put it on a trailer or the back of your truck and just brought it to a track you rode around but then you have to deal with everybody at a track riding like fucking lunatics where i just want to sort of cruise around we we're going into a turd um i don't know i'll figure it out. someday i'll figure it out uh all right u.s out of cash hey billy bankrupt good news and bad news good news you were right bad news well the u.s treasury announced this week that we could run out of cash by september i also read that the u.s budget deficit is at minus 23 percent so we can't afford what it'll cost to run the country when they balance the books at the end of the day uh can't wait to get my hands on those freshly printed three dollar bills they'll print to take our attention away from it uh yeah this happens every single year um it is it's a fucking ponzi scheme and we're all tied into it like i don't know what's going to happen but uh you know, what should happen is it should go bankrupt. All the people that got us to this point should go to jail and we should start over again and we should have a system set up where this can't happen again. And, uh, you know, from what I used to read on it, once you had the Federal Reserve and that our money was being printed by a private corporation, um, it was an inevitable that someday this day was going to fucking happen. And the only thing that I can say, the only positive thing that I can say is that I don't think that, you know, the Federal Reserve wants to destroy this country unless you believe in the new world order, which is a fucking pipe dream. But I, I wouldn't underestimate them trying to go after that. There's no way you're going to get everybody in the world on the same fucking page. Okay, you can't even get the Middle East on the same fucking page. Was what the fuck we've been trying to do. The same page being our page. Which, yeah, why, why wouldn't they go for that? Hey, you should live the way we say you should live. And then we should control your natural resources. All right, girlfriend's pet. Oh, boy. What does she have? What does she have? She got one of those little dogs. Is it fucking yipping at you? All right, girlfriend's pet. Uh, hey, Bill, love the podcast. Always good for a laugh. I'm a 20 year old man and I got this girlfriend. <laughs> I got this girlfriend. You already sound like you're out the door. You don't, I don't have a girlfriend. I got this girlfriend. Like I got this problem. I love her very much. Okay. Well, okay. I guess I was wrong. Her pet bird, not so much. You see this bird, bird is small, only a parakeet, but it, it sure is aggressive towards me and anyone but her and her mother. So aggressive that even being in the same room makes it dive bomb me almost every time I'm there. It bites her even sometimes and draws blood. Well, put the thing in a fucking cage. Anyways, now I kind of like this bird even though it fucking hates me. We lay in bed and watch TV together. What? The girl, the bird, and me. Oh, Jesus. Not just the bird and I. Okay, cool. Now I don't want to be a cunt and tell her that she needs to put the bird away while we are hanging out, but it starts to get out of hand. So far so that she starts to cry whenever I suggest some alone time with just us. She cries over that? What? That's fucking weird. Dude, I would slowly back out of the room be like, hey, I'm going to go uh, get some bird seed. I'll see you later. That's it. 
Yeah, dude, that's fucked. That, that, is, that is bizarre. Now, this girl whom I love is very sensitive and emotional, and I'm an angry ass. Oh, boy. So your advice about screaming in the car as I go home usually works, but this is where I draw the line. She has told me multiple times that if she has to pick between me or the bird, it's the bird every day of the week. Well, there you go. There's your answer. You can't get mad at honesty, sir. You just have to act accordingly. This pisses me off. How can she choose that fucking animal over me? I get it. She loves it, but I'm her boyfriend. Yeah, and you're also not trying to hurt the bird. The bird's trying to hurt you. But I'm her boyfriend in over a year, and I'm honestly insulted. So, Bill, how do I ask her to just put the bird away for a little while every day so that we can hang out on our own? Anyways, thanks a lot, Bill, and come to South Dakota sometime. Um, this is what I would do. I'd stop going over there and just say, listen, I respect the fact that you love that bird so much. Okay, I respect your wishes. Okay. But I also respect my own well-being. And I don't want to, you know, if I had an animal that was hurting you, there would be no question it would not be in the room if you came over. Okay? I've asked you nicely. You don't want to do it. I respect that. So if you want to hang out with me, come over my place. Leave the bird at home. All right? If you ever want me to come over there again, you have to put that fucking bird away. Don't say fucking. You got to put the bird away. It's not fair to me. All right? The fucking thing bites you. I think he even said drew blood one time. Um, So, yeah, that's the deal. I mean, the bird's not going to listen to her day. Is, is, is it? I don't know. That's what I would do. I don't know, buddy. I, I don't, I don't, I don't, uh, I don't know about that draft pick either. You know, I guess I could see if she was 13, but she's 20 years old and she is like that about a fucking bird. Uh, I don't know. That's fucking weird. Like I said, I get love in animals. I love animals too, but not to the point where I choose them over another fucking human being when they're trying to hurt that human being. All right, here we go. Guys insecure about their girlfriends. Hey, Billy Brostash. I was going on a run yesterday and we were... And was finishing up as I got back into my neighborhood. Um, What? I was going on a run yesterday and was finishing up as I got into my neighborhood. I I live in the lower east side of Manhattan, which, as you might guess, gets a lot of foot traffic on a Saturday afternoon. Anyway, one of the people I saw was this big dude and his girlfriend. I kind of looked at them for two or three seconds as I was jogging, which I think is totally normal thing to do. Two or three, I don't know, three is a little, that's a little forward. As I was passing them, the guy leans in and says in a stern voice, keep your eyes up, buddy. I didn't understand what he said at first, and I kept jogging. But if I did, I definitely would have said some shit back. I guess he thought I was checking out his girlfriend. I really don't understand people who think like that. In my mind, if I know I'm the only one fucking my girl, I could care less if other people look. Yeah, because you looked too. You're like, God damn, that woman's gorgeous. I want to talk to her. Then she talked back and now you're going out. Yeah, if you're with a beautiful woman, you got to expect guys are going to look. Um, this dude looked like he could have been a football player, so he probably has a big ego. Easy now. Now we're making all kinds of judgment. I love the shit football players get. Like, they're all fucking assholes, and nerds are all these nice, empathetic people. They're not. They're passive-aggressive cunts. And they would be the way football players, the stereotypical ones, behave if they were bigger and knew how to fight. Anyways, I'm curious how a woman would feel if her man... Look at, look at that fucking asshole on Facebook. Look how he, all of a sudden, that little shit gets power. You can't even cancel your fucking account. Enough with the hacky trashing of football players. Fucking, the real fucking problem, these fucking nerds, these spineless fucking nerds who are creating all this spyware and all of this fucking shit that goes on out there. These fucking algorithms where they're peeking into your life. They're fucking weirdos. What does a football player do? Hang you by your underwear? As opposed to these fucking assholes building nationwide fucking uh, uh, systems to spy on their own fucking people? 
Then one of them finally grows his spine, Snowden, and we all turn our back on him and just leave that guy twisting in the wind. He's somewhere in fucking Russia. That guy's a fucking hero. Anyway. Um, anyway, it's this dude like he could have like he could have been a football player, so he probably has a big ego. But to me, it just seems really insecure. I'm curious how a woman would feel if a man did that as well. It's not like I was ogling the girl. I think some of them like it. Most of them don't. Some of them, you know, are just the biggest shit show. If you have a guy like that, they like, you know, the guy getting all fucking pissed off and fighting over him. Um, anyways, as I, as a side note, something similar happened a year ago at the beach when I was admittedly checking this older woman out. Great cans. All right, dude. Now, I don't know. This is the second time, second inc- uh, incident. Her husband saw me and walked up to me and started yelling, why are you checking out my wife? Yeah, dude. All right. All right. There's something. Fuck all. This is you. First, I said, I don't know what you're talking about, but he persisted. Luckily, I had six inches of height and maybe 30 pounds on him. So I looked him in the eye and said, so what, man? And he walked away. Curious to hear your opinion on guys like this or if you think I'm an asshole. Thanks. Go fuck yourself. Yeah. Well, you need to you need to get better at your leering game. Okay, she's got a nice set of tits. You're going to look. You're a man. Right? Same way if you had a bulging fucking wallet of cash, they'd be checking you out. <laughs> I had to get one in. Um, yeah, I would just be a little more discreet about it, you know, and I'd be a little more respectful, okay? If a guy's with the woman and she's hot, you want to look, just look when he's not looking. That's it. But you're going to look the same way that fucking asshole who's getting upset, he looks too. Everybody looks. Guys, look, women know we look. That's why they walk around with half their fucking titties hanging out because they know they're not going to have to buy a drink. Okay, and then they lie and go, no, I thought I looked cute. You can't look cute without hat with your without your butt crack peeking out of the back of your fucking pants. Um, Would you come here to fix a sink? You came here to fuck somebody. Um, All right. That's the podcast. That's the end of the ignorance for this week. Um. you know, reading this Ken Stabler book, I'm coming to the end here. He's uh, been traded to the Houston Oilers for Dan Pastorini. And I realized Dan Pastorini also wrote a book. And I remember John Madden wrote a book. So I was curious to read the John Madden book because he's going to be talking about coaching the Raiders for those 10 years and when they got Ken Stabler and his feelings on him. And then I can read Dan Pastorini. Because I remember he went to Oakland and it didn't work out. But I guess afterwards he became like a drag racer, like a successful drag racer. And he used to like to raise hell and go out like Ken Stabler did. So I, I got to read that book too. Um, and considering the summer doesn't end at the end of August, I have plenty of time to read these books. So I'm going to read finish the Ken Stabler book today. And then I'm going uh, <laughs> to go on to the Dan Pastorini book. You know, he's a, and then I could say I'm a really well-read guy. All right, that's the podcast. Uh, go fuck yourselves, and I will check in on you on Thursday.